Great day, great day, great day, beautiful people. Hold on. I need to forget it. I was going to plug in my, my microphone, but that's all right. We're just going we're just gonna to rock with it. I forgot about it. Um, welcome to Reading with Jam. I am Jam, or Jamile. <laughs> Jamile Calpin. Um, doing this reading with Jam to practice in public. I'm a voiceover artist, a voice actor, and I do a lot of other creative things as well. Um, but what I've been doing is reading personal development books that I, I'm personally reading to help myself, but also to help those who want to tune in, but also at the same time practicing in public as a voice actor, voice narrator um, of books, of content, of text and stuff like that. So I've been reading Real Artists Don't Starve by Jeff Goings, and we are continuing that today. Um, we're going to be reading chapter 11. Um, just a heads up, after I finish this book, which has a couple more chapters left, uh, I will be transitioning Reading with Jam to my Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash Jamile Calpin. So my Instagram handle is pretty much the same thing everywhere else. Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram. So if you're looking for me in other places, even LinkedIn. So if you're looking for me in other places, like if you want to work with me as a voice actor, or if you need help with uh, like content creation, because that's, that's what I do. I help people get started with podcasting. If you feel like you're technologically challenged or you just want help to get started uh, with, the tech, the tech, with the technical stuff, I am there to help. Uh, but here with Reading with Jam, like I'm saying, um, I'm trying to share personal development stuff, and I will be continuing to do that on my Twitch channel. So it's twitch.tv slash Jamile Calpin. And so I'll be reading, doing Reading with Jam there as well as um, I make, mu make music. Um, I call it uh, Beats for My Health. Um, I wrestle with um, mental health, or I wrestle with depression, anxiety, and things like that. So to help manage my mental health, I uh, use making music as a creative outlet, as an emotional release valve to help get my thoughts together, to help get my emotions and stuff together. And I believe every man uh, needs that, every person needs that, um, and, and definitely encouraging every black man to find an emotional release valve in your life. And for me, um, one of those release valves is making beats. So making beats for my health, that's what it's called. So do a reading with Jam and then making with beats on my Twitch channel. So if you're interested, go and check it out. Follow me, uh, subscribe there, all that stuff. But all right, let's get in it. Get into today's reading, which is Real Artists Don't Starve by Jeff Goings. And we are reading chapter 11. The title of this chapter is Diversify Your Portfolio. Here we go. Chapter 11. Diversify your portfolio. The starving artist masters one craft. The thriving artist masters many. In this I would fight for, the freedom of the mind to take any direction it wishes, undirected. John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck. In 1987, Mark Fornfelder read an article in an issue of the Whole Earth Review about the indie magazine revolution. He thought to himself, we've got to do a zine ourselves. It would be so much fun. The next year, he and his wife started Boing Boing, a pop culture and technology publication. It launched first in print, then online in 1995. The project was mostly for fun. Mark was a mechanical engineer at the time. When Boing Boing launched, he kept his job in the disk drive industry, but the seeds for a creative career were planted. In 1993, Mark was invited to join the team at Wired Magazine. An associate editor, he launched their first website and became acquisitions editor of the magazine's book publishing division. He did all this without any formal journalism experience, while still doing Boing Boing on the side, learning as he went, having fun every step of the way. In 2005, Mark's curiosity led him to found another magazine called Make, which covered technology projects in the growing maker movement. Ten years later, he self-published a book about magic tricks. Today he runs many projects, including Boing Boing, which is still up and running. In addition to the writing and publishing projects, Mark is also an artist whose work has appeared in exhibitions throughout the United States. He designed the cover art for Billy Idol's record, Cyberpunk, and has worked on many print ads and other creative projects. This is how Mark's brain works. 
He can't stay stuck on one thing for too long. He must move from project to project, idea to idea. For better or for worse, he said, I am really interested in a lot of different things, in trying things out myself to see what it's like to actually experience... Wait, pick up. <laughs> I'm really interested in a lot of different things, and trying things out myself to see what it's like to actually experience producing media or other things is always interesting. Often we think a lack of focus is a bad thing, but that's not always the case. Publishing magazines, writing books, teaching magic tricks, designing album artwork for punk rockers. Does this sound like the work of a master artist? It should. Not because Mark does one thing, but because he does many. The Rule of the Portfolio When asked the question, what do you do? Most of us tend to answer with a one-word reply. Either that, or we stumble over long, complicated responses that leave the person confused. But since we, but since when does a job, but since when, but since when does a single job description define what a person is capable of? It doesn't. For the past century, we have been told a story about work that says we must commit to a certain path in life, spend most of our career doing that one thing, and not veer too far from our area of focus. This, we think, is what mastery is all about. But is that really what great artists do? Is mastery made of one craft or many? Your art is never beholden to a single form. You can always change and evolve, and the best artists do this regularly. They understand that in order to thrive, you have to master more than one skill. This is the rule of the portfolio. The starving artist believes she must master a single skill, whereas the thriving artist builds a diverse body of work. In the Renaissance, people embraced this intersection of different disciplines and those who blended them best were rightly called masters. Today, we live in what is called the gig economy, where jack-of-all-trades have opportunities to thrive as never before, giving birth to a new kind of worker. Business philosopher Charles Handy called this class of workers who, who juggle more than one thing at a time portfolio people, and, pre and predicted soon we would all be living these kinds of lives. It seems we are, it seems we are now living in that reality. It is hard to tell them when people ask me what I do. Pick up. <laughs> it is hard to tell them when people ask me what I do, Mark told me from his home in California. What I do is just pick one thing, and I'll say, I'm a magazine editor, or a writer, or a blogger. So, yeah, I think I'm just generally a person who will do things that require creativity and communication. Of course, he does much more than those things, and the fact that he feels a need to explain himself tells us how much we like to pigeonhole people into a single job description. But we don't have to do that. Like Mark, we can develop a rich and diverse portfolio that allows us to, in to do interesting and creative work for a lifetime. In the new renaissance, our success is conting contingent on our ability to master multiple crafts. The reason we do this is that it gives us an edge on the competition. Would you rather hire a writer who is only good at crafting prose? or one who also understands marketing? Would you prefer to work for a boss who only knows how to get things done, or one who also has emotional intelligence? When we develop a diverse portfolio, we do better and more interesting work. A Distractible Mind Starving artists believe that to make a living, you must make money off your art. But thriving artists don't just live off their art. Liking, like good investors, they keep diverse portfolios, relying on multiple income streams to make a living. Rarely do they go all in on any single area of work. The challenge, then, is knowing what investments to make and when. In 1985, Michael Jackson paid $47.5 million for a music catalog that included 250 songs by the Beatles. At the time, people in the industry thought the deal was crazy. It was such a large sum of money, and the artist was quickly becoming one of the most popular musicians in the world, racking up hit after hit. Why distract himself with him with investing in another artist's music? It didn't make sense. But Jackson knew the Beatles' catalog was invaluable. What's more, he believed it to be an important piece of history, a cultural artifact worth, worth preserving. It also ended up being a sensible investment. Since Jackson's purchase of the Beatles catalog, the value of those songs has increased more than 1,000%, making it worth more than...
0.5, well, I don't know why I said that, write it this way, sorry, making it worth more than 0.5 billion dollars. Wouldn't that just be half a billion dollars? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Couldn't, could just wrote half a billion, anyways, making it worth more than half a billion dollars. I could be wrong. Anyways, the acquisition was one of the greatest deals in music business history. Surprisingly, it wasn't initiated by a producer or record company executive, but by an artist. The exchange was executed by someone who, in our minds, should have been focusing on his craft. Should Michael Jackson have been playing music and performing, not orchestrating eight-figure acquisi acquisitions? After all, it wasn't even his music. But he was doing just what thriving artists do. He wasn't going all in on one big bet. He was diversifying his portfolio. How did Jackson see the potential in the Beatles catalog when no one else did? And why was he paying and why was he paying attention in the first place? Predominantly, it was his own business sense, said entertainment, uh, entertainment attorney Donald David, who knew Jackson personally. I once sat and talked to him for over an hour, and he just knew the music business front to back, and he had good instincts. He had really good instincts. Jackson's instincts told him that it wasn't enough to just sing and perform. He needed to master more than one thing if he wanted to stay in control of his work. And today, thanks to those instincts, Michael Jackson's estate is worth billions. Not bad for a kid who grew up singing rhythm and blues with his brothers. Creative people tend to live in the world of ideas and possibilities. Because of this, we may struggle with a lack of focus. But this is not always a bad thing. A wandering mind can be an asset if you learn how to use it. To spot the right places to invest your time and resources, you need what Dr. Dara, Daria Zabalina calls a leaky mental filter. A researcher who teaches at Northwestern University, Dr. Zabalina, has discovered a link between creative achievement and the ability to broaden a person's attention, just as a hint a voice actor hint whenever you're doing any kind of read or whatever it pays to do research on names locations and stuff like that so that you can pronounce it cor correctly but also so that you can have a better understanding um in the context of what you're reading so like with personal development kind of con uh content whatever i know content is where this used over and over and over again but when you're reading this kind of material you definitely won't need to research names, locations, um, sometimes even the acronyms of certain stuff. Because um, you might see an acronym. For example, I'm trying to think of one. I just did something that used the, the acronym for real estate. It was a real estate, something related to real estate, but it was like real estate something investment trust. But the acronym is, is spelled R-E-I-T, but it's pronounced REIT. Never knew that, never heard of that, but doing a little background check helps when you're serving your client or whenever you're producing any voiceover work. But let's continue. <laughs> so we'll pick up. Dr. Zibelina has discovered a link between creative achievement and the ability to broaden a person's attention. A leaky mental filter, filter is the ability to hold multiple conflicting ideas and tension with each other in a way that they can build upon each other. People with leaky and leaky attention might be able to notice things that others don't notice or see connections between things, she told me, which might lead to a creative idea or a creative thought. This ability allowed Michael Jackson to see something nobody else saw. It gave Mark Fraudenfelter the ability to build a diverse portfolio that allowed him to work on Boing Boing and Wired at the same time, not to mention countless other projects. Both were competing interests for his time and energy, and both flourished. Under the right circumstances, being distractible can be a strain. If you think about the most creative people, therapist Chuck Chapman told me, they're the ones who innovate. They come up with the ideas, and I think the fact that your brain is going so fast all the time and seeing so many possibilities, that's what creates innovation. Not only does a leaky filter give you insight into possibility, it allows you to identify new opportunities and take advantage and take advantage of them. Tackle new skills. In the middle of his life, Michelangelo, now a well-established artist, undertook a new discipline, architecture, and began designing St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. 
At a time when most people double down on mastering the skills they've already acquired, he learned a new one. He did this at the beginning of his career too, starting with sculpture, then moving to painting and other crafts as, they need, as the needs arose. Every decade or so, the artist would tackle a new skill, essentially reinventing himself and adding something new to his ever-increasing portfolio. And because he did this, he was unbeatable. Later in life, he oversaw the construction of a major building project that required him to become a foreman. Michelangelo ended up being an excellent organizer of labor, spending decades running huge creative projects as head designer and supervisor. Some of these projects were carried out by more than 300 assistants, all hired and supervised by the same man who, same man who painted the Sistine Chapel. It is not the singularly focused mind that is able to manage such feats, nor is it the reclusive artist who can manage a team. Rather, it is a distracted mind that can bring such energy to tackle a wide array of projects. Michelangelo was more than a sculptor or a painter. One historian went so far as to call him a CEO. But all his skills complemented one another, building on each other and creating a memorable body of work. How did he do this? He rarely said no to a new skill, at least when it could contribute to his portfolio. If we want to create enduring work, and not just a series of one-hit wonders, we too must be open to learn to learning new things. The path to a diverse portfolio is not a series of giant leaps, but of small steps. One skill sets into motion the need for another, and so on. In Michelangelo's case, his adeptness at sculpture led to learning architecture, which he didn't attempt until he was 40. These things take time, but the eye for possibility prepares you for such an undertaking. With a superior ability in sculpting, Michelangelo was able to grasp the fundamentals of architecture and translate those lessons to becoming an engineer. In his spare time, he wrote poetry. There are almost no writer artists, writer slash artists in the world who are both poets and artists. Historian William Wallace told me, Michelangelo is a major poet as well as a major artist. William Blake is one of the others. To have that capacity means you have a brain flexibility that allows you to move between word and image, and that gives you a tool set that gives you a bigger range of vocabulary than some of the rest of us. This is the leaky filter in action. Michelangelo acquired the skills he needed, which allowed him to spend the greater part of a century creating. He was not above learning something new and was adept at taking it all in, then focusing on the right thing at the right time. You build a diverse body of work by embracing different interests, then using your leaky filter to explore opportunities and add new skills to the portfolio when needed. Michael Jackson's openness to identify business opportunities and a willingness to grow in new areas allowed him to not only make a profitable investment, but also secure a cultural heirloom. Starving artists try to master one skill. Thriving artists acquire whatever skills necessary to get the job done. One is about short-term rewards. The other is about creating for a lifetime. If you don't believe the myth that mastery is just, just doing one thing, then you too can create a body of work that will endure. Oh, sorry. I always say forever. Sorry. I pre-read. So again, when you're doing, especially for like audiobooks and stuff, a good, good piece of advice is like you definitely want to pre-read what you're getting ready to record for your client. Again, I'm practicing in public, so I'm not pre-reading. But you want to read ahead um, so you get a better understanding, especially if you're doing like fiction, because you want to know how the story goes and so stuff like that. Um, but while you're reading, you're kind of like reading ahead too. Um, but you want to, again, stick to what the script says. Like you want to stick to what the text says instead of just implying stuff. Because the more efficient and accurate that you can get at it, the better that you can get at it and can save time because when you're because we all do that like if we're reading an article even if we're watching tv or watching a movie we try to predict but there's a skill to actually just being present it's there's a skill and a mindset to actually being present with the text that you're reading to be present with the music that you're listening to to be present with um the films that you're watching and the tv shows that you're watching like Try not, try, 
try it. If you're watching a TV show or reading a book or something, try not to predict what's going to happen, but to be present. And usually what happens with good writing, good directing, good composition for music and stuff like that, it draws you in so that you're not thinking ahead. Like you're just so captivated in, in the moment that you're present. And it's like it's like you're almost in that world. So you're not even thinking ahead. You're just moment by moment, second by second, you're just there. Like that's... That's a great skill to be able to be able to have if you're you're a creator, capturing your audience so much so that they're hanging on every word, every note, every frame that they're seeing in that in that moment, and not wandering in their thought, or wandering in in anything else. They're just there. Sorry, that's just a random nugget. So let me read that line again. If you don't believe the myth that mastery is just doing one thing, then you too can create a body of work that will endure. Diversity pays. In 1992, a 27-year-old rapper named Andre Young, a.k.a. Dr. Dre, started Death Row Records with his partner, Suge Knight. The new label was launched just after Dre's exit from N.W.A., the hip-hop group that had launched his career. It was a risky move to walk away, but this was the kind of thing that would allow Dre to succeed in ways no other rapper had. Death Row began with $2,500,000 of startup capital. Less than a year after forming the company, the two partners signed a $10 million deal with Interscope Records to distribute their records. They had been acquiring artists such as Snoop Dogg, Tupac Shakur, Shakur, geez, Tupac Shakur and MC Hammer, just t- terrible, all who went on to become enormously successful. I did not know that MC Hammer was going through death row. That's interesting. The label retained all publishing and recording rights. By 1996, the company was making more than $100 million a year. Four years after co-founding the label, Dr. Dre was unhappy with the direction of the company and his partner, who was becoming increasingly dangerous. Suge once once negotiated a business deal on Dre's behalf with a baseball bat. Despite the success they were experiencing, Dr. Dre decided to walk away from death row, leaving behind a 50% stake in the company. He not only gave up all rights to the company, he also lost his own recordings as an artist. Once again, he was on the next thing, on to the next thing, a new label he called Aftermath Entertainment. At Aftermath, Dre attracted new talent, including rappers Eminem and 50 Cent, helping launch their careers to incredible stardom. Death Row was eventually sold off for $18 million, a far cry from the $100 million it had bringing in it had been bringing in. Dre's instincts were right. Moving on, no matter how costly, was the right call. As we've seen, there are benefits to not getting pigeonholed into one thing. Throughout his career, Dr. Dre would continue to branch out into new ventures, acquiring various skills as he went. And as he did, he began to see new possibilities for his art and business. In 2006, Dre met with friend and music producer Jimmy Iveen, I feel like I'm saying that wrong, but anyways, Iveen was concerned with two problems currently facing the music industry. The first was how piracy was affecting record sales, and the second was the prevalence of low-quality audio due to Apple's plastic earbuds. (laughs) Apple, Iveen said, was selling $400,000 iPods with $1 earbuds. Dre responded with a similar amount of frustration. Man, it's one thing that people steal my music, he said. It's another thing to destroy the feeling of what I've worked on. Iveen and Dre decided to do something about it, and together they created the headphone company Beats, of which Dr. Dre is the main representative. I don't know if he is anymore. Of course, Dre is not just the face of Beats, or of anything he does. He is the producer, the linchpin, the man making it all happen. It started with helping launch NWA, which brought attention to the West Coast hip-hop scene. Then... He founded not one, but two successful record labels that launched the careers of countless artists. In with Beats, he was involved not just in the design of the product, but in running the business as well. I've been living the American dream for over 25 years, he said in an interview. Just being able to do what I do, be creative, and make money out of it, it's incredible. Until recently, many professional musicians could only make money off a few income streams which at most included live events, record sales, 
royalties from licensing and merchandise. For some, there weren't even that many, as in the case of songwriters relying primarily on income from songs. Today, things have changed. The, today, things have changed. The digital music revolution brought with it some challenges, but it also introduced new possibilities. Now we have the chance to expand our portfolios of work into successful careers, but we must be willing to do what Dr. Dre did and seek them out. Dr. Dre eventually sold off Beats, yeah, sold off Beats to Apple in 2014 for $62 million. The deal made Dre one of the wealthiest musicians alive, but it also taught him an important lesson. He had left so many things behind for the sake of something new, and at times, it looked like artistic flakiness. But it was more than that. What Dre was doing was not just bouncing from one creative project to the next. He was building a portfolio. Today, his old partner, Suge Knight, is in prison, and Dr. Dre is a billionaire. <laughs> Trash, yeah, that sucks. Anyways, sorry. This is how you build a body of work. You seek out new opportunities and skills, developing a leaky filter to take it all in, and then focus on the skills needed to do the work. In the end, it's about the work, and for Dre, that's not just making music. It's embracing any opportunity to create something new and interesting and helpful. Like, it, like any thriving artist, he does a lot of things, and that ability to master multiple disciplines has made him very successful. After all, it was his curiosity that drove him to keep creating and searching, even when it meant leaving behind work he had spent years creating. Still, he understood that his best work lay ahead of him, not behind. The same is true for you. Focus on the big picture. There comes a time to not let your mind wander, to dig in and focus. When you learn to lock in on the larger ideas and let the rest fall to the wayside, you begin to think more about the body of work you are creating than about a single creation. Cultivating a portfolio mindset will keep you focused on what really matters, not on any single work, but on the whole creative life itself. How then do we take a wandering mind and turn it into a diverse set of interests and skills that can become a body of work? Being distractible can be a strength in creative work. When we understand that an open mind can guide us into new possibilities, we don't have to try to change ourselves into being more organized or responsible. Instead, we can use our creative quirks to our advantage, helping us identify opportunities to do fulfilling work that we would have otherwise missed. We must also practice using our leaky filters to find new skills, then learn and apply them. The goal is to use anything that will help you develop a more substantial portfolio, which can lead to a lifetime of creation. And we must keep focusing on the big picture, remembering that what matters more than a single creation or two is building for ourselves a flourishing creative life. Just as, just as smart investors build diverse portfolios, thriving artists create a body of work that makes them proud. The negative, Mark Frohnfelder told me, is that you tend to get spread out a little too thin, and maybe you don't master certain things as well as other people who are obviously focused on something. I wouldn't necessarily recommend being a jack of all trades, but I think it's worked for me, and I'm happy living a life of exploring different ways to be creative and try to make a living at the same time. In his career, Mark has had many different jobs, from working in startups, excuse me, pick up. In his career, Mark has made, had many different jobs, from working in startups to participating in conferences and innovative innovation labs, and it all began with an open mind and a willingness to try new things. Of course, juggling so many things can be difficult, and there are real costs to a life filled with, will, filled, <laughs> life filled with diverse interests, but when you understand this is not an event but a process, the work becomes richer. When we focus on the big picture, we create for ourselves in the world a portfolio worth noticing and remembering. All right, that concludes chapter 11 of Real Artists Don't Starve by, <laughs> by Jeff Goings. Real Artists Don't Starve by Jeff Goings. Again, if you're interested in this book, I still need to put a link there so you can buy this book. Because you should. This is a good book. Whether you feel like you're an artist or not, it can be used in any and every aspect of your life. But yes, thank you for joining me again for another episode of Reading with Jam. Um, <laughs> I will be, uh, like I mentioned earlier, 
I will be transitioning from Instagram to Twitch to continue the reading with Jam and my other public practicing in public of my other creative endeavors and stuff. Just because I believe Twitch has a better platform and um, for, for for me, but also for the viewer too. Because again, uh, if you're listening to this, you may not want to listen to it at one time speed. You may want to listen to it at two times speed so that you can get to the book, get to the content faster. Hey, I get it. I do the same thing all the time. It's like, I don't know, if you're, if you're fran- fans of The Matrix, I, I think of the scene when, <laughs> the scene where uh, Neo is just downloading all the information, and then, you know, he stops and he's like, I know Kung Fu. Um, I feel like with podcasts, with YouTube channels, with audiobooks, everything, being able to use two time or three time, I've seen places that have four times speed. I, I can't, I'm not that good yet. But multiple, you know, multiple of the normal speed that you can consume that content, it makes me feel that way, that I'm just sitting there and just downloading all this information and it's just consuming it quickly. I think that's the closest thing we're going to get to to being uh, jacked into the matrix right now. Um, But anyways, sorry, again, for another tangent. Um, Yes, thank you for joining me for Reading with Jam. Um, If you're interested in continuing to follow me, uh, please do so at Twitch tv slash jamile calpin that's twitch.tv slash jamile calpin um once i finish this book i will be transitioning over there um, but i still i'm still gonna have to do stuff here on instagram but it's gonna be more related to do make something podcast and uh, things that i'm going to be sharing to help black men um stop being mediocre and to become excellent because i think we need that in our lives and in our community today um, and it starts with thinking better and managing our mental health and having better thoughts so that we can have a healthy mind. All right, that's, that's, that's for another subject, another day. Hope you all enjoy your day. Make the most of it. Have a great one. Have a great one. Be safe. Try to, you know, fully use the grace that grace that uh, God has given you and uh, just enjoy. Enjoy. Like, let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments and delight in the work that he's given you to do. You know? All right. Talk to you guys later. Peace.